She certainly did the, uh, the household numbers with seeming grace and, 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 and uh, very generous commitment as caring for her mo ill mother. Equally, she was uh, extraordinarily resourceful and, 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 and uh, reassuring to those who were variously dependent upon her as her sister, Lavinia, and many others, many others. Uh, so how to be a poet seems to me the, uh, the, um, the crisis which she must have had to deal with utterly alone, because uh, it's like Bunting's great sense of it was born in upon me at the age of four that I was a poet, but it was very difficult because I didn't truly know what a poet was. Uh, nor do we yet uh, know in any comforting. We know what a lawyer is, or we know what a doctor is, or we know what a, a number of human determinations of this kind are, but we certainly don't know what a poet is. We, we can think of it in many ranging, associating ways, as say, I think one of the classic circumstances of such thought would be um, would be uh, Robert Graves' terrific text, initial text, in a sense, of uh, The White Goddess. But anyhow, we can oh, I remember once being in jail here in San Francisco, as Ron Lawson would re well remember, and uh, I was kept after he was happily let go for a weekend on the charge of grand vagrancy. And I remember, therefore, on Monday morning, as all others thus held were now being uh, taken to court and being, you know, arraigned. They had that scene where you get up on a darkened uh, stage that was brightly lit, actually, with floodlights, except the whole, all this presence of persons was dark. And you, you know, being used for process of identification by witnesses, et cetera, et cetera, but you filed, and you stood five at a time on this broad, you know, broad scene. And you were questioned each in turn, uh, name, and uh, what do you do? And I'll never forget it. <laughs> it was the great moment of my life. Um, I thought, what the hell, uh, I'll go for broke, man. I, no more of this closet shit. I'm really going to get it out there. And what better place than in Bryan Street Jail, you know, or wherever it was. We, I don't remember clearly where I was taken. It was not beaten or anything. It was quite benign, but uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I said, uh, I said, what's your name? And I said, you know, Robert Creeley. What do you do, Robert? And I said, I'm a poet. And there's this great titter, you dig? And there's the sudden sneering voice of the questioner saying, oh, that means you hang out at Aunt Harriet's tea room. And I said, I've been there, sir, but I, you know, sure. And uh, the pretension was that being a poet would necessarily identify me as homosexual. So, I mean, it's like killing two birds with one stone. Uh, poets and homosexuals, we know those guys. And uh, so, and then things went on. What have felt remarkably freeing, you know, um, but I thought, here I was, I think very close to 30. That must have been about 1955, maybe. So I was within a year of being 30. And uh, I still felt an extraordinary trepidation or confusion as to how I would publicly be a poet. I mean, I could be a poet with friends who were poets or friends who were sympathetic to it. But how to be a poet walking the common street? Uh, it remains a problem. <laughs> But the, uh, one can sense what kind of a problem it would have been in, in, uh, in the particular enclosure of academic and social habit that must have been Amherst. And I don't think they would have been freaked, but you would have to be a poet uh, like, you know, like Longfellow or Bryant, or a poet that was recognizable within the, uh, within the imagination that was the stable and, and, and casual and usual one of the, of the time. Uh, and this seemingly applied to friends as specific as Samuel Bowles, et cetera, et cetera. So anyhow, that's musing. I don't know any more than anyone else uh, why or wherefore, but it makes, again, Robert's ways of thinking are immensely interesting and attractive. And that one instantly uh, uh, proposes what to me is the, uh, is the far more actualizing crisis that she must have had to deal with. And I, I know, one knows from reading uh, all of the various data, letters, of the three volumes various of her letters, but one knows how uh, intense this time was. Uh, so then, let's presume that she's been, she it has been a poet for some time, with or without her, her conscious apprehension. 
but I'm sure that it gathered and grew and specifically became. If only that when she writes to um, Colonel Higginson, that's what I want to get to is the place, uh, it's fascinating to see how she presents herself. Now, this is going over material that I'm damn sure has been variously read and heard by you quite a bit. But there are several things that I had, frankly, never quite done before, and that was to, to think about the poems that she sends him, specifically. Think of yourselves variously as writers. You think you're, it's either whether you're sending out to some publication, but you want to, uh, you want to see what's out there and you want to see what its responses seem to be and what its qualifications of your activity are. It isn't just wanting to get published, but you want to reify. You know how, frankly, one's first publication is, a, is an objective, re no matter what the magazine or what attitudes or proposals, seeing your own work in print is a beautiful and, and reifying moment. It objectifies, it makes an objective reality for that which has been uh, you know, really one's uh, own, own ability to sustain as, an, as, as something done in the imagination of its condition. Having it in the, in the public print, it's like Olson's, again Olson's, we who live our lives quite properly in print. In the letters, in the poem addressed to Vincent Freeney, where he's, he's speaking sadly of the outrage he feels in his friend's conduct, but is saying, you know, we who live our lives quite properly in print, it's appropriate that we should do so. This is our act. We are writers. We are poets, specifically. And I remember there's a beautiful take uh, by Sherwood Anderson remarking how he was hanging out at a bookstore that had had his, I think, his first book on, in the window. And so he's walking as, as unobtrusively as he could back and forth to dig the book being there. You know, I can dig it. Ah. Great. So I want to get to this moment. This is the year, this is that extraordinary year when her, um, when if you look in the collected poems, you see just by looking at page numbers, there's this extraordinary, uh, um, out, yeah, this extraordinary articulation of, of poetry. So this is the time when she presumes uh, presumes to, uh, to address herself to Higginson, who has had this uh, article in the, um, in the Atlantic Monthly of that time, uh, an advice to younger writers, and um, it's terrific. <laughs> and it's lovely to get, again, Leda's book is very attractive because you get lovely uh, uh, context about what others of the time and place were feeling about the article. Uh, for instance, uh, March 29th, 1862, in, in, in the books, authors and art section of the, the Re Springfield Republican, uh, quote, the Atlantic Monthly for April is one of the best numbers ever issued. Its leading article, T.W. Higginson's letter to a young contributor, ought to be read by all the would-be authors of the land. It is a test of latent power. Well, whoever rises from its thorough perusal, strengthened and encouraged, may be reasonably certain of ultimate success." <laughs> cool. See, again, one has a lovely flavor of the rhetoric of the period. It's terrific, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I want to get to her first letter to him. Um, And then just after that, in March, as he has a question mark because he can't literally date it, um, she has a, the end of the final quatrain, it's a quatrain from a longer poem, actually. It don't sound so terrible quite as it did. I run it over, dead, brain, dead. Put it in Latin, left of my school. Seems it don't shriek so, under rule, et cetera, et cetera. Let me see now. In the April issue of the early April question mark, in the April issue of the Atlantic Monthly, E.D. reads, quote, letter to a young contributor, unquote, quote, this is Higginson. Human language may be polite and powerless in itself, uplifted with difficulty into expression by the high thoughts it utters, or it may in itself become so saturated with warm life and delicious association that every sentence shall palpitate 
and thrill with the mere fascination of the syllables. Oftentimes, a word shall speak when what accumulated volumes have labored in vain have labored in vain to utter. There may be years of crowded passion in a word and half a life in a sentence. Such being the majesty of the art you seek to practice, you can at least take time and deliberation before dishonoring it. <laughs> Such being the majesty of the art you seek to practice, you can at least take time and deliberation before dishonoring it." And then E.D. to Higginson, April 25th, quote, I read your chapters in the Atlantic, dash, and experienced honor for you, dash. I was sure you would not reject a confiding question. Then follows the whole letter. Which you read. Then here's what, so, she, uh, April 15th, Tuesday, E.D. writes to Thomas Wentworth Higginson enclosing four poems and a signature. It's lovely. You see, the, again, what I love in this book is there's the reproduction of the uh, facsimile of the letter, which is terrific. Are you too deeply occupied to say if my verse is alive? The mind is so near itself it cannot see distinctly, and I have none to ask. Whew. Should you think it breathes, and had you the leisure to tell me, I should feel quick gratitude. If I make that the mistake, if I make that mistake, uh, uh, I can't quite read this, but I think it's, if I make the mistake that you uh, dared to tell me, would you, could you give me sincere honor toward you? I enclose my name asking you if you please, sir, to tell me what is true. Etc. Very moving. The four poems that she encloses are very are interesting to me for the reason that they are not uh, they are not chronologically. I know that when I would not I, but I mean one yourself is a is a possible location. <laughs> there better be. Uh, that the probably my impulse in such a circumstance would just send the last four poems I'd written, you know, presuming they were as great as always the last, as also said, the last poems one's writes are always the most interesting. And uh, she, this, what I'm simply saying is that there's a quite deliberate um, uh, choice. And she's, as I say, she's writing an incredible amount. The first poem in the cluster is one one you surely know, uh, safe in their alabaster chambers. I just want to read it um, so you get a sense of what Higginson was. Safe in their alabaster chambers, untouched by morning and untouched by noon, lie the meek members of the resurrection, rafter of satin and roof of stone. Grand go the years, and the crescent above them. Worlds scoop their arcs, and firmaments row. Diadems drop, and doges surrender, soundless as dots on a disk of snow. She had written an earlier version. That's the version of 1861, as the text tells us. She had written an earlier version. 1859, um, and that version had been both in punctuation and in uh, the final verse uh, quite different. That's interesting because one can see how the dashes begin to, to, to take the authority of what is often a comma or also how lining begins to shift for her. Safe in their alabaster chambers, untouched by morning and untouched by noon. Safe in their alabaster chambers, dash, untouched by morning and untouched by noon, dash. Sleep the meek members of the resurrection, dash. Rafter of satin, comma, and roof of stone, period. <coughs> Light laughs the breeze 
in her castle above them, dash, babbles the bee in a stolid ear, comma, pipe the sweet birds in ignorant cadence, dash, ah, what sagacity perished here, exclamation point. Her sister-in-law hadn't had objected to the to the, what she felt was the increasing abstraction, apparently. That's, she used another phrasing, but it seems to be that's what bothered her. It was floating and didn't seem to her to, to either develop or move with the initial verse. So that that was interesting, that she certainly had the, uh, the, uh, the reaction of, 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 of Austin's wife and her very particular friend at this point, um, that she did have a few golden ears in Allen Ginsberg's phrase that could hear. So she shifts to that second version and apparently, presuming that later, and he seems in all else responsible, is giving us the order in which they were, were uh, that was the piece. It's interesting that it's a piece that was written three years previous and a piece that she had really worked over. We have you know, absolutely uh, clear evidence as to her writing. There's either, even a further shift that she makes, but this is the seemingly the version she resolves on that she sends to Higginson. So anyhow, that dates uh, 59, revised 61, and sent to Higginson in, in the spring of 62. Uh, then the next one is one moves a bit into the content, moves into the time. 320 is the poem, the first line, we play at paste. Uh, I try not to make babble so much, just want to, we play at paste till qualified for pearl, then drop the paste and deem ourself a fool. The shapes, though, were similar, and our new hands learned gem tactics, practicing sands. It's kind of a poem about writing, haha. <laughs> That's 1860, circa 1862. The next one, uh, is also the next two more, then they're, they're both within the so-called period. In fact, the, uh, wait a minute now, she moves back to the poem that in the, chrono in the chronology presumed here is the poem that comes just before. The nearest dream recedes, unrealized, the heaven we chase like the June bee before the schoolboy invites the race, stoops to an easy clover, dips, evades, teases, deploys, then to the royal clouds lifts his light pinnace, heedless of the boy, staring bewildered at the mocking sky, homesick for steadfast honey. Ah, the bee flies not that brews that rare variety. That is curiously tricky, and it's tricky in mind and must have given Higginson expectable confusion. And the, the last of the four is one that's interesting. She has that one that she obviously worked on, and in this situation, she's effectively sending this, this, and this as company for them. I'll tell you how the sun rose, a ribbon at a time. The steeples swam in amethyst. The news, like squirrels, ran. The hills untied their bonnets. The bobolinks begun. Then I said softly to myself, that must have been the sun. But how he set, I know not. There seemed a purple style that little yellow boys and girls were climbing all the while, till when they reached the other side, a dominie in gray put gently up the evening bars and led the flock away. It's curious, some kind of cutesy or almost little girl tone, little childish tone, but that's, anyhow, those are the four, uh, with the signature and the, let me, T.W. Higginson adds a postscript to a letter to James T. Fields at the Atlantic Monthly, uh, I foresee that, quote, young contributors, unquote, will send me worse things than ever now. <laughs> Two such specimens of verses came yesterday and day before, fortunately not to be forwarded for publication, exclamation point. Um, then in the meantime, Worc Worcester, April 16th, Austin Dickinson's 33rd birthday. Higginson 
in the Emily Dickinson's Atlantic Monthly, October 1891, the record. On April 16th, he's talking, he's right, this is an article he subsequently wrote after her death, in, written in 1891, a piece called Emily Dickinson's Letters. This is his rehearsal of the circumstance. On April 16th, they had good mails in those days, <laughs> uh, even though it had, I could take five days to get a letter 20 feet, but anyhow, on April 16th, 1862, I took from the post office in Worcester, Mass, <coughs> where I was then living, the letter from E.D. of April 15th. The letter was postmarked Amherst, Palmer, which you know in New England, Palmer's just down the way. And it was in a handwriting so peculiar that it seemed as if the writer might have taken her first letters her first lessons by studying the famous fossil bird tracks in the museum of that college town. I don't think it looks that bad. There again, that's it. Uh, but again, one's interested in the various shifts in the handwriting. Obviously, they're used for dating, but it's curious to see the moves of that emotional order also. But the most curious thing about the letter was the total absence of a signature. It proved, however, that she had written her name on a card and put it under the shelter of a smaller envelope enclosed in the larger. Enclosed with the letter were four poems. Um, that would be interesting. I mean, again, I'm not a, I was certainly not a psychologist or a psychiatrist or anything akin, but I love that. Uh, what is that? I would read that very simply and immediately as... Uh, something she subsequently emphasizes, the, the me of the poems is not me. <laughs> uh, there's a separation. I am asking you, just as someone else might ask you, what do you think of this? Uh, here are the four, here are four, it doesn't say here are four poems, uh, etc. But here, here are the poems, here are the questions, and then finally here is the person. I mean, it isn't, they're not a sequence, but they're not to be confused one with the other. Uh, they are each a particular circumstance. Cranky in obvious ways, but makes a lot of obvious sense to me. It's like having a friend do it. There's a great uh, story of John Ashbury's first publication when he's still at, at um, Deerfield Academy, not far from Amherst. He, uh, he's, uh, he's very good, as he always is and has been. <laughs> Uh, and he's, uh, his friends really think he ought to try to get published. And they're sort of leaning on him to try to send out some of the poetry. So he's, he's characteristically shy about it. So they finally uh, send some for him. And uh, they send a poetry magazine, which is very impressed by this young person's abilities. But moments later, John does get his courage up, apparently, sufficiently to send some himself and sends effectually the same poems. <laughs> I guess a very stern letter back as I heard the story uh, saying, young man, it is very inappropriate that you try to plagiarize the verse of your fellow school friend. We know those poems. He has happily sent them to us otherwise, and you know, you are to be severely reprimanded for trying to. So this sense of who are you is rather important. <laughs> Dig it. <laughs> Quote, now, after April 18th, Higginson in the Atlantic Monthly in that later article, circumstances brought me in contact with an uncle. This is the Norcross connection. William, but it's the Dickinson married to the Nor William in that situation, not, not the Norcross. He's, he's a classic um, from the grandfather, I believe. Soon brought me in a contact with an uncle of Emily Dickinson, a prominent citizen of Worcester, a man of integrity and character, who shared her abruptness and impulsiveness, but certainly not her poetic temperament, from which he was singularly remote. He could, not, he could tell me but little of her, she being evidently an enigma to him as to me. It's hard to tell what answer was made by me under these circumstances to this letter. It is probable that the advisor sought to gain time a little and find out with what strange creature he was dealing. I remember to have ventured on some criticism, which she afterwards called, quote, surgery, unquote. <laughs> and on some questions, part of which she evaded, as will be seen, with a naive skill such as the most experienced and worldly coquette might envy. <laughs> uh, E.D. writes her second letter to T.W. Higginson at Worcester. It was April 25th, so it was 10 days later. Uh, Your kindness claimed earlier gratitude, but I was ill, 
and write today from my pillow. Thank you for the surgery. It was not so painful as I supposed. I bring you others, as you ask, though they might not differ. While my thought is undressed, I can make the distinction, but when I put them in the gown, they look alike and numb. You ask how old I was. I've made no verse but one or two until this winter, sir. Well, we know that she made quite a little verse before that winter. Uh, so again, she's really, she's, uh, you see, the point is that she's creating, a per she's making a person as well as all else. She's trying to, and she's certainly not about to, uh, to, to get intimate with this person. You ask how old I was. I made no verse but one or two until this winter, sir. I had it, and then the famous reference, I had a terrace since September, I could tell to none. And so I sing, as the boy does by the burying ground, because I am afraid. You inquire my books. For poets, I, this too has been much emphasized. I have Keats and Mr. and Mrs. Browning. Well, again, we know from, from uh, much record that she had a far wider range of reading than that would imply, even as, even as affection. I have Keats and Mr. and Mrs. Browning. For prose, Mr. Ruskin, Sir Thomas Brown, and the Revelations. I went to school, but in your manner of the phrase, had no education. That's, well, that, what's, what's so strange about that? Uh, <laughs> I went to school, but in your manner of the phrase, had no education. When, I, when a little girl, I had a friend who taught me immortality, but venturing too near himself, he never returned. Soon after, my tutor died, and for several years, my lexicon was my only companion. Then I found one more, but he was not contented I be his scholar, so he left the land. You ask of compa my companions, Hill, sir, and the sundown, and a dog large as myself that my father brought me. Again, Robert Duncan was very, very useful. He was thinking of, um, of Carlo, this, this, this dog, as being in some respects like, as a familiar. Again, Robert, the other evening, was emphasizing how close uh, the historical and imaginal ground of, of witchcraft truly was. This is, uh, this is a, very, uh, a, a very particular presence. And uh, again, as say reading Graves' text or many other echoes, the, uh, the, uh, the what call it, imaginal circumstance of poetry, poets, is very, very close to that of uh, Madge or, 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 or Seer or Witch or uh, you here is very, very close. And uh, as much in the circumstance that is tacitly uh, forbidden, not so much as conduct, but certainly as common information, much, much that's uh, uh, ritually enclosed. <coughs> And is not uh, is a power. As in, I remember, it took me years to realize that uh, it's like William saying, all his life is a doctor, and he did only in age did he realize that there was a connection between venereal and Venus. And I had somewhat the same. I had never thought of the obvious connection between uh, uh, putting someone under a spell and the common sense of spelling in, that you learned in school, how to spell, you know, and. I mean, teachers, I mean, again, not that they were right, but I mean, no teacher ever told me that learning to spell was learning to spell, you know, and that that was the power I was being given in no metaphoric sense. It was, it was learning to spell. So that was interesting to me as a context. These poems, so I have a brother and sister. My mother does not care for thought. And father, too busy with his briefs to notice what we do, he buys me many books, but begs me not to read them. <laughs> I mean, she, yeah, she's someone immediately after my hat. He buys me many books, but begs me not to read them because he fears they joggle the mind. <laughs> they are religious, except they, my family, are religious, except me, and, and address and eclipse every morning whom they call their father. <laughs> but I fear my story fatigues you. <laughs> I would like to learn. Could you tell me how to grow? Now, this is again very interesting thing, just what I, Robert was thinking of, what, what I was just thinking about. But I fear my story fatigues you. I would like to learn, could you tell me how to grow? Or is it unconveyed? 
like melody or witchcraft. You speak of Mr. Whitman. I never read his book, but was told that he was disgraceful. <laughs> I could not weigh myself, myself. My size felt small to me. Is this, sir, what you asked me to tell you? And again, I won't read the poems, but just to note them, the four poems she includes, 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 includes in that letter are There Came a Day at Summer's Full, 322 in this sequence, and again, that would be there four poems that occur within in the pattern of the poems here presented. Uh, there would be one poem divided. And see if that one is here. Yeah, no, that's there. She effectually sends the next two poems in the sequence of all the sounds dispatched abroad, 322, 321. Then she goes back again to a markedly earlier poem. It might be interesting to read it. Um, having said she wrote only that winter, she sends him a poem that she wrote, uh, let's see, how many years previous? Uh, sort of, I'm interested by that, just as a, as an, as a, as a sense of where where she is. And think of again of going places. Uh, she wrote this poem again. This is goes back to 1859, so it's three years previous. Let's see. South winds jostle them. Bumblebees come, hover, hesitate drink and are gone. Butterflies pause on their passage cashmere. I, softly plucking, present them here. That's interesting to me. Just forget, if you will, the, yeah, the slightness of the, but what I'm interested in is the fact that she sees the agencies of language as making actual in mind what is absent in fact, you dig? Very simple, but a peculiarly difficult uh, experience to have people practically acknowledge. Uh, I was fascinated as a, as, a, as a kid by the expression I found in a, in a book, uh, a critical book by I.A. Richards, uh, quoting a Mencius or some, someone as that, uh, a very simple sort of classic Chinese uh, apothegm, uh, how is it far if you think it? <laughs> I still haven't got that quite resolved, <laughs> but it's a fascinating thing. If you're ever lonely or can't have nothing to do, the television's broken or there's no one to talk to, or just spend time with how is it far if you think it? And I'm very, I, I don't know how it is far if I think it, <laughs> but I think it's something that's, that's interesting to think. How is it far if you think it? Anyhow, that point, butterflies pause on their passage cashmere, I dash softly plucking, comma, present them here, exclamation point, um, et cetera, et cetera. The, again, in the usual sense of her, the continuity is, um, is given really as that primary letter, and then there are details taken from the second letter, but one doesn't recognize that these two letters were written so, so one so quickly after the other, and that they included these eight, now eight poems, that's a substantial number. Again, thinking of contemporary circumstance, uh, I remember one of the rules of thumb that I was given as a, as a young writer, poet, uh, was not to uh, send too many poems. You know? <laughs> send your best, but keep it to three or four. Don't, don't send, because they don't have time to read all that stuff. And they'll just open your letter and see all these poems and say, forget it. You know? and, uh, so be canny, send only a few. Uh, four, let's say, four short poems. And then if there seems to be some yielding, send them some, we'll get back to them quickly. Uh, she's very much of this. I mean, she's very, very specifically that way, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and on June 7th, there's some delay. <coughs> And then he's writing again, writes in the later article, it is possible that in a second letter I gave uh, more of distinct praise or encouragement for her third is in a different mood. His letters sadly don't survive otherwise. Uh, she writes her third letter, June 7th, Saturday. Your letter gave no drunkenness because I tasted rum before. Domingo comes but once, yet I have had few pleasures so deep as your opinion 
and if I tried to thank you, my tears would block my tongue. Your second letter surprised me and for a moment swung, capitalized. I had not supposed it. Your first dash gave no dishonor, comma, because the true are not ashamed, dash. I thanked you for your justice, dash, but could not drop the bells whose jingling cooled my tramp, period. Perhaps the bomb seemed better because you bled me first. <laughs> I smiled when you suggest that I delay, quote, to publish, unquote, that being foreign to my thought as firmament to Finn. If fame belonged to me, I could not escape her. If she did not, the longest day would pass me on the chase, and the approbation of my dog would forsake me then. My barefoot rank is better. You think my gait, quote, spasmodic, I'm out of business. You think my gait spasmodic, I am in danger, sir. You think me uncontrolled. I have no tribunal. Would you have time to be the friend, quote unquote, you should think I need? I have a little shape. It would not crowd your desk nor make much racket as the mouse that dents your galleries. Sounds like, yeah, I was reading Dahlberg this morning, too. It's a curious parallel. If I might bring you what I do, not so frequent to trouble you, and ask you if, it, if I told it clear, T'would be control to me. The sailor cannot see the north, but knows the needle can. The, quote, hands you stretch me in the dark, unquote, I put mine in and turn away. I have no Saxon now, quote, I mean, then it continues in, as a poem. As if I asked a common alms, and in my wondering hand, a stranger pressed a kingdom and I, bewildered, stand, as if I asked the Orient, had it for me a morn, and it should lift its purple dikes and shatter me with dawn. But, comma, will you be my preceptor, unquote, Mr. Higginson, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then on her fourth letter, mid-July, I mean, it begins now to be a substantial this is the letter that describes herself, which is curious. Could you believe me without? She, she wants, he wa asks her for a picture. He's now intrigued. Um, could you believe? Says, I must soon have written to her to ask for her picture that I might form some impression of my enigmatical correspondent. <coughs> could you believe me without? I had no portrait now, but now, but am small like the wren and my hair is bold like the chestnut burr, and my eyes like the sherry in the glass that the, gl that the guest leaves. Would this do just as well? <laughs> Would this do just as well? It often alarms father. He says death might occur, and he has molds of all the rest, but has no mold of me. But I noticed the quick wore off those things in a few days and forestall the dishonor. You will think no caprice of me. You said dark. I know the butterfly and the lizard and the orcas. Are not those your countrymen? I'm happy to be your scholar and will deserve the kindness I cannot repay. If you truly consent, I recite now. And she encloses four more poems. Of tribulation, these are they. And she hasn't noted I spelled ankle wrong. <laughs> On a, your riches taught me poverty. Some keep the Sabbath going to church, and then finally the one success is counted sweetest. I am happy to be your servant. Will you tell me my fault, frankly as to yourself, but I had rather wince than die. Men do not call the surgeon to commend the bone, but to set it, sir, and fracture within is more critical. And for this preceptor, I shall bring you obedience, the blossom from my garden, and every gratitude I know. Perhaps you smile at me. I could not stop for that. My business is circumference. This is the first initial, extraordinary reference to that word. An ignorance not of customs, but if caught with the dawn or the sunset, see me. Or if, but if caught with the dawn or the sunset, see me, myself, the only kangaroo among the beauty, sir, if you please, it afflicts me. And I thought that instruction would take it away. 
Because you have some, have, because you have much business beside the growth of me, you will appoint yourself how often I shall come without your inconvenience. And if at any time you regret you receive me, or if I prove a different fabric to that you supposed, you must banish me. When I state myself as the representative of the verse, it does not mean me, but a supposed person. You were true about the, quote, perfection, unquote. Today makes yesterday mean. You spoke of Pippa Passes. I never heard anybody speak of Pippa Passes before. <laughs> You see, my posture is benighted. Th to thank you baffles me. Are you perfectly powerful? Had I a pleasure you had not, I could delight to bring it. You're a scholar, etc. cetera. Uh, then, too, it's interesting because, again, what's so interesting in this situation of the way this book is ordered or presented, uh, very shortly after that, she's writing to a friend Eudocia Flint with flowers. You and I didn't finish talking. Have you room for the sequel in your vase? All the letters I could write were not fair as this, syllables of velvet, sentences of plush, depths of ruby, undrained, hid lip for thee, play it where a hummingbird, and, and sipped just for me, and sipped just me, Hem Emily. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then uh, sends a letter from Massoid House for Eliza's CD. Had a letter from Emily Dickinson with five exclamation points. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Higginson writes to uh, E.D. In, re in, in retrospect. It would seem that at first I tried a little, a very little, to lead her in the direction of, r of rules and traditions. But I fear it was only perfunctory, and that she interested me more in her, so to speak, unregenerate condition. Still, she recognizes the endeavor. In this case, as will be seen, I called her attention to the fact that while she took pains to correct the spelling of a word, she was utterly careless with greater irregularities. <laughs> um, then the next slide, this, this, no, this is useful. And then she writes him in early August. Are these? And she encloses, before I got my eye put out. Remember the one sort of closed with last time. And I cannot dance upon my toes. Uh, are these more orderly? I thank you for the truth. I had no monarch in my life and cannot rule myself. And when I try to organize, my little force explodes and leaves me bare and charred. I think you call me wayward. Will you help me improve? I suppose the pride that stops the breath in the core of woods is not of our self. You say I confess the little mistake and omit the large, because I can see orthography, but the ignorance out of sight is my perceptor's charge. Of, quote, shunning men and women, unquote, they talk of hallowed things aloud and embarrass my dog. <laughs> he and I don't object to them if they'll exist their side. I think Carlo would please you. He is dumb and brave. I think you would like the chestnut tree I met in my walk. It hit my notice suddenly, and I thought the skies were in blossom. Then there's a noiseless noise in the orchard that I let persons hear. You told me in one letter you could not come to see me, quote, now, unquote, and I made no answer, not because I had none, but did not think myself the price that you should come so far. I did not ask so large a pleasure, lest you might deny me. You say, quote, beyond your knowledge, unquote, you would not jest with me because I believe you, but, perceptor, you cannot mean it. All men say what to me, but I thought it a fashion. <laughs> when much in the woods as a little girl, I was told that the snake would bite me, that I might pick a poisonous flower, or goblins kidnap me, but I went along and met no one but angels who were far shyer of me than I could be of them, so I haven't that confidence in fraud which many exercise. I shall observe your precept, though I don't understand it always. I marked a line in one verse because I met it after I made it and never consciously touch a paint mixed by another person. I do not let it go because it is mine. Have you the portrait of Mrs. Browning? Persons sent me three. If you had none, will you have mine, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, well, I, I think that's ample with what presumably you, you, you have as your own reading and experience of her. Uh, to to uh, see beyond the uh, 
simple use of details from the letter to qualify a, a, a given fact of her, you know, the report of her. But again, I'm really asking or depending on you to hear that as persons who've had a parallel situation uh, and who know, therefore, the, uh, the, both the crisis and the inherent uh, dilemma of presenting this, this, not just fact of oneself, pre presenting this thing of oneself. Uh, those of you who uh, are parents, for instance, uh, know the peculiar dilemma of presenting a child to, to others, uh, on the one hand, the ch uh, one's own child to others, because it's so immensely present and significant in one's own experience. And, you know, with the best will in the world, it can't be of any like magnitude for those who hear, yeah, nice little baby there. He looks sort of like you. Looks like you, George, or looks like you, Mabel, or whatever. I mean, it certainly is not going to be the immense uh, presence or, 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 or fact of, th of, of, of reality that the parents will hopefully experience. Uh, nor does, say, loving one's child argue that one, in fact, often to the contrary, it argues that possibly that one will not love children at large nearly as much as those who are not thus involved. Uh, I really, talking to dear Tom Clark, I realized that, well, yeah, of course we should. Any poet has that which he or she uses as determining condition or source or possibility, all of those things. Uh, and it's like pounds, what thou lovest well shall not be reft from thee. And the uh, absolute uh, authority or, the, or, the, or, the, or, the, or the, the, the value of that relationship is, is uh, beyond all, 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 all measure. So that, again, one hears not simply a, uh, a psychologically uh, uh, I don't hear simply a psychological sense of, uh, of uh, attempts to be childish or coyly girlish. Uh, I hear a very uh, uh, determined creation of presence that is not just cannily trying to outwit Mr. Higginson, but is wanting to be present to his attention in ways that will permit retreat and will continue authority I mean, I read the letters as, as an absolutely an act of writing as, uh, of equal distinction as the poems themselves. I don't feel that they're, I think they're just as uh, intuitively and consciously determined, uh, just as one would, say, choose clothes to wear today. Uh, this act of choosing seems to me immensely significant in, how, in the way she presents. And the, uh, Again, if one reads and reads and reads uh, her work, uh, the, the sense of the white election, not simply the, ch the chastity, but not simply the innocence, but the, it's more like she doesn't want, obviously, to distract him in ways that will block the possibility. So I think, too, her saying that she doesn't want, wish to publish, or it's as strange, would be as strange to her as, as it would be for a fish to be stuck in the sky to be you know, published. I think it's, again, a, uh, a sense of wanting to know the, uh, the, the, the condition of the person that's being addressed and wanting to know what he is recognizing or seeing the poems as being. So the, uh, it isn't simply a fictitious, fictitious person that she's playfully creating, but she's creating a, a persona that will permit his, uh, his authority. You know. You know, uh, you could write him a letter saying, well, Mr. Higginson, I read your article, and since you uh, are concerned with the young, and I am younger than you, uh, here are some poems of my composition which I think you would do well to publish. Uh, I'll expect to see them in the next issue. Uh, failing that, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, you know. But you hear, in other words, she attempts, she cannot attempt, and she must have recognized the, uh, the task that, um, I mean, the very title of Higginson's piece uh, sets the stage, you know, uh, for her for her conduct, and she she creates this cannily intriguing presence. And again, I was fascinated by what again is very common information: Higginson's letters to his wife uh, after he visits, uh, and he speaks. He gives an incredible picture of her. She really got to him, that's for sure. And the letters primarily, but now in presence, she's equally uh, overwhelming. 
Uh, he's, he mocks her size and her, uh, the way she's dressed and the flower and stuff. But she also, uh, he speaks of her as having drained him entirely. <laughs> she, almost in vampiric, he's, she's really taken everything out of him. She's, she's uh, exhausted him, although, and she has talked primarily. She has absolutely uh, uh, drained him, as he says, quite explicitly of all, the, all energy. B bewilderingly, he doesn't know quite what's happened to him. <laughs> uh, now, her, her, res her relation to other persons, I don't remember any letter or reference to her as seemingly having quite that effect. Uh, in other words, certainly no one references to her commonly among school friends is that she's this witty, you know, humorous person. She's, people like her because she has this lovely, uh, uh, playful way of making things be. Not just that she can invent pleasant games, but she has a way of putting it, so to speak, placing it, that is, um, makes one think of it in a, in a delightful and, 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 and interest, engaging way. Happy, pleasant, funny, witty. I remember I wrote a poem for my dear Aunt Bernice, uh, and the final line, I can't, I can't remember, remember it clearly, but it, you had wit, you know, that was my dearest pleasure in my Aunt Bernice was she had that classic New England wit. And it was an absolute delight. And I presume, reading the various records of, of, of letters and whatnot relating to Emily Dickinson, that she was extremely witty. You know, and the connivance of that presence is an absolute is 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 dense with wit. Uh, if one would simply not see her as this uh, hindsight image of person that is, you know, here a little child I stand heaving up my either hand or something hand. You know, that sense of the pathetic pathos of the, inge the ingenuous simplicity of the child, and see this person rather, 1862, as this extraordinarily powerful person. I mean, a person so powerful that she, you know, floods all time and space uh, with her authority. Again, Robert has a great phrase taken from Blake, the authors are, are in eternity. And I don't have the least proposal that she knew she was in eternity, therefore it's sadly in her imagination dead, but that she, remember she says, i never forget, she says, my business is to comfort. I think that's in a weird way as close as she comes to laying her cards on the table, you know. She says, I'm a, it's far more than saying I'm serious, I really want to be a poet, so my business is to comfort. Okay, let's, t uh, I have no idea where, where we are or what we're doing, uh, but it's almost three o'clock, and I wanted to engage this time far more the uh, action of the people, particularly in the class or anyone else. So, um, what? Yeah, what occurs to you? Any kind of questions or anything? Let's, now we can take a stretch. Uh, anybody got anything that they'd like to broach, bring up, or question? Anything? You want to take a break and then we'll return? Okay, let's do that. I had wondered uh, that uh, way of putting it that in 1862 the production is a, a poem, it, it, if one would have assigned the numbers to, to the measure of days, you would have a number of poems equal to the number of days in the year. That's quite little. In fact, there are, there are one or two that are located uh, apart from the, the general sequence that would, eat, would add one or two more to that number. So that um, that's an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary production, like they say. And then I was, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. And then the, I was trying to see, just to give it another measure, which, what it would look like if you were to just take simple pages, you know, and say, 
how much did she write? It's, you know, and, you know just give me a moment to get to the beginning. 300. That's 300. So if you go from poem 300 to, I just want to see what the page would be. It's page 141, no, from page 141 in this text to page 330. So that's, that's uh, almost uh, 200 pages of, of particular poetry. And again, knowing the uh, way she's writing and the, and the intensity of the concentration, the, uh, whatever, I want to say, not in any generalized, not simply in a generalizing sense, but whether or not one might argue the relative virtues of the poems, et cetera, et cetera, saying, well, there's a lot there that I wouldn't think terrific. But actually, there's a remark I, I would say it's remarkably interesting as a sustained intensity of, of writing. Um, it's a remarkable, you know, to, to have that much activity, that much poetry, not simply as I wrote a poem today or something, but just that incredible, she's on a, a roll or a, a high beyond incredible. Um, at the same time, it's, she's writing you know, a lot of letters, et cetera. She's involved in the, certainly in the house scene. Uh, she's reclusive, but again, I, I'm trying, I suppose, to think of this as the circumstance of a of, a, of, of a, a practical address, like they say, to the situation of how, how is she going to write, you know. Uh, so I think that that would be, to me, the going places. We know, for instance, one knows that she leaves the house certainly when she goes at the age of 35, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is even two or three years before that time. Uh, so she's certainly not reclusive in the sense we presume, or have presumed, the critical sense of her being so shy she can't endure the presence of others or, or so turned off by the world that she can no longer enter it. Uh, it must have been a simply, a, to my mind, not complexly, the, uh, the dislocation that the, uh, that, um, the other demand made. I've, I can't imagine, a, I remember one time in Happy Company with Carl Ricosi, we were momently going to teach these two various workshops or businesses at Naropa. And we were thinking of possible procedures of things, ways in which, you know, you could teach responsibly or do something responsible in that circumstance. And I remember Carl Ricosi saying with, I don't, you know, not the least, um, if you know him, you know what I mean, it wasn't the least of uh, easy, but he said, well, the, the last thing in the world a writer needs is encouragement, uh, which would seem to be, an, what do you mean they don't need encouragement? L look at this. But I think what he means is that writers write no matter what. Um, it isn't obviously a, a comfortable situation, but the, the writers that, that I've known certainly uh, did not need uh, to be, you know, to be persuaded or encouraged or led into writing. You, you, you virtually couldn't stop them. And in another way of putting, I heard another poet, very different disposition. In, in fact, uh, years ago, Winfield Townley Scott saying uh, that uh, to someone who was asking him about possibilities of poetry, et cetera, saying, well, he said, well, don't do it if you don't have to. Which he didn't again mean as some negative, he meant, uh, if you don't feel the absolute insistence, uh, there is no, uh, if there's not a need in the Zukovsky sense, out of deep need, uh, there will be only a desultory activity that is really not that socially or otherwise interesting to be engaged with if you have something else you can do with more, with more, you know, more, more commitment and, and, and more interest. Uh, hanging out with poetry is a very boring activity. Uh, that's all, and I would think that would certainly feel true to anything I'd ever known about the circumstance or witnessed in friends and, and relations otherwise. That one certainly uh, wasn't involved with it as some, um, as some sense of a social possibility or economic or whatever. It seemed to, it seemed to be one, uh, it's like Olson's poem in Cold Hell and Thicket, you know, what he has to say. 
both has what he has as a, as a thing to be said, but also what he has to say. Um, what he has to say are, are Williams in the desert music, that, that incredible uh, circumstance. Uh, so that I presume uh, that Emily Dickinson, given that extraordinary moment or time, is writing out of the uh, both the deepest of need and the deepest of, of, of articulation and the deepest of the most extraordinary mastery, you know. So that that world is absolute and is not divorced from, it's not like you go to that world for a while and then you come back to this world. So, you know, uh, it, isn't a, it isn't something that can be divided. It, per, it permeates and takes all. Uh, so that uh, it's, it's a wonder only that she uh, could manage all else that she did given that intensity of activity and that not the paucity of intellectual or social support but this paucity of recognition that's what's fascinating about her that she that she can survive in this magnitude of 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 of, of, of um, genius with such a curiously uh, uh, awkward uh, social and uh, otherwise pattern of of, of, of circumstance uh, isn't that anyone's out to get her? I don't really buy the Stern Father situation. That she had, she had fact of the period, the cultural and social disposition, which was certainly, if no, if one were more feisty and um, took the world uh, more, more to task, or, or enter, entered it, or really wanted the, the contest. If one got off on, on, on the battle, uh, then one could make a dent. As does her. Friend, possibly the uh, the person who most uh, who most recognizes her is, I think, really uh, uh, the Helen Hunt uh, Jackson seems to be the one who hears her most specifically and who doggedly uh, wants to get her poetry into print. Uh, and um, you know, but at that point, the uh, psychic risk is really too, too distracting. I don't think it would wipe her out, but it would be a you know, if. You know, for instance, again, if you're right at poets, uh, how, uh, like Pounds, my, the, the enmity of my friends, you know, uh, hurt my, as he put, I can't remember quite, but my green time. I mean, the fact that those closest to him as, as uh, writers and poets, their, their distaste with one another and their arguments and battles really was an intense and, 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 and very painful distraction. Uh, trying to make the peace, or keep the peace rather, between variously Wyndham Lewis and Joyce and Eliot and et cetera, was a very cumbersome and difficult distraction. And when it, you know, so that I dare say she neither wanted that conscious, or the other, other person was much more able to, to like to get off on it probably. We read the accounts of the two persons as kids. They, again, later have some parallel or other discussions. And uh, Helen Hunt was uh, socially more equipped. The family moved. She had a more various. She didn't have the location. You dig? Again, we're talking of someone who, who's living literally in the family homestead. You know, I mean, this past summer I had the deep pleasure to knowing his work only peripherally, but not very truly at all. But always having what I did know a d deep pleasure. I went to the home of. Um, uh, Leopardi, the great Italian 19th century poet. And uh, it's a magnificently pleasant house, really a good house. And um, you could see for miles and miles up further into the hills, but also down to, all the way down to the coast. Magnificent, uh, small town. And uh, he too was thought to be sort of reclusive. I think he came out of the house now and then, but why didn't he want to go to Rome or why didn't he move? But uh, I could. It would be absurd to leave a place so fecund in your need, you know, in that which you needed, you know, and uh, so fecund dating. And however we imagine uh, uh, Emily Dickinson's situation, we must realize that it was extraordinarily it, it gave her what she needed. She did. Uh, yeah. 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 I was visualizing the shape of your skull in that portrait yeah. of her, the dark dress and the sharing eyes. The skull is so present. Again, we're talking about the business of the home, whose business is in Mr. Covenant. Right. Is there anything else to say to that except that that's. 
Well, in no selfish sense, uh, but truly in a selfish sense. When I say in no selfish sense, you can be damn sure it will be in a selfish sense. Um, I want to, as the so-called last talking, I want to track the word circumference through a diversity of reference in the poem. And I also want to, um, yeah, using that, that, what she says to Higginson. Because it turns out the word circumference is, uh, is not a, uh, it's, it's a complex reference. It has to do with that parameter. Uh, it's also interesting that it has parallel with the circumstance of center, that which is centered, like the Bible is, a, is center, has a center. And the, uh, in other words, it's, I, I was really intrigued by how circumference uh, works as a term for her and what it seems to, what it says in diverse locations and habits. It's also a word that is, is used uh, all through the poems, and the work goes from beginning to end. Uh, it's a key, a key term. And I think, again, it's in no casual use in that letter to Higginson. And I know what you mean. It's, I think of Olson's use of, in some ways, seemingly equivalent, uh, his sense of landscape, you know, um, or, 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 or almost in a pound sense of periplum, you know, what one what one has is the as 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 the fact as the presence of of, of it of the uh, of the outside. She has fascinating poems also as the inside outside that have to do with that. I was one way of thinking of it was an emanation such as dropping classic pebble and classic pool will produce, or sound waves, or it has various in some contexts it has to do with uh, with the influence or emanations of an act or text or a person or a thought, it has to do with that. But it also, um, it's a curious sense if one again takes it to the proposed person. Uh, when she says, my business is circumference, uh, does it, does she mean she is, I mean, thinking of classic high school geometry, you know, does she mean only that circle around the center? Or does she mean the situation of the going and coming or the, all the area thus described? Does, does she, is it how, like how is it far if you think it? What, what is, what is the, uh, what is the uh, place that issues, that comes of that proposal? And what is the activity therein? For me, uh, well, why wait? Why, it, reading the, uh, reading the poems and the various prose uses of the word, uh, it seemed more and more a, a sense of relational patterns. The circumference was her way of stating the context or ground of, of relationships, and the, the uh, not simply the fluid or changing in some time sense, but the uh, the all that was all that was there as a as a relational associational expanding pattern. Uh, so again, when one finds her. Uh, resistant, not just resistant, but if, not refusing in an emotional sense, but simply not uh, joining the church, uh, the uh, circumference is again much, much, much involved. It's, uh, again, I want to be more, I mean, I want to have the particular text in hand, God willing, and uh, so, that, so that there can be at least, you know, some meager demonstration of the preoccupation. Uh, Many, many references to it, but none that do much more than remark, she said, my business is circumference. And then there's a presumption that she wanted what was around rather than what was in the middle, in the middle. <laughs> Whatever that means, you dig. Um, maybe she felt like Wittgenstein, that a point in space is a place for an argument, and uh, didn't like arguments. <laughs> Or did wanted wanted the provocation of what thus the argument maybe the argument is this, is the circumference I don't know see again it's a curiously volatile phrase uh, anyhow I was just looking at um, pictures so again I certainly emphasize the interest of these various uh, books the um, what else we might mention in terms of going places. Uh, is the, uh, the so-called master letters, which are intense, uh, curious letters of class of love. Again, written in a tone, not, not, um, 
not uh, not like specifically, not that they are the same rhetoric as the Higginson letters, but they are certainly uses of rhetoric as, as far more intensively. E.g., once this letter, just looking at quickly, begins, if you saw a bullet hit a bird and he told you he wasn't shot, you might weep at his courtesy, but you would certainly doubt his word. You know, this, this uh, one drop more from the gash that stains your daisy's bosom, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a... Uh, it, said it also has poems in, in it. Uh, it's very curious. Anyhow, there's a, there is, I suppose, one would be foolish to, to, to object that there is a, a characteristic stance that she takes in relation to someone either loved or, or otherwise interesting to her. And it really is this, she becomes very, not just plaintive, but she becomes, she, she diminishes, you know. She diminishes what, not that she loses, but she puts in a curious smallness what the power of her authority really is, you know. But that's an old-fashioned trip. Every, you know, I certainly, many people do that. It's only me, you know. I'm nobody, who are you? Do you believe that? <laughs> I mean, that's far more uh, who wants to be somebody in the estimation of uh, such a mawkish uh, group, you know, to, to an admiring bog, you know. Uh, if that's what it, or Williams has, I, I don't think he quite meant it either, where he says, I'd rather uh, go off and die like a sick dog than be a well-known literary person in, in the United States, you know. Well, he, but I know that he wanted to be a well-known literary person. Wanted it very. I remember Dahlberg saying, "Don't go see Williams. He's too bitter, and he's bitter because he's not a well-known literary person. I mean, he's, it's uh, it's not a pleasant thing if you've worked and feel that you have a, an art that is um, not just communicable, but really will change the lives of those who read it. Um, which is why 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 else write if you don't think your writing is is the greatest writing that was ever written? Don't bother." You know. I mean, that's not just ego, that's, I mean, again, one thing I really wanted to get back to that I was thinking of just we've, as I stopped talking the other time was that the uh, so-called ego state of this circumstance has to be extraordinary. I mean, it isn't just mono, mono, monomania, but again, I think those, those of you who write know how extraordinary the demands on a, on a, on a not just a meanness. I mean, again, she's alert or particular. It isn't me, but to... To have this thing in mind that's so intensive and variable takes an extraordinary coherence. And then you have all kinds of psychological numbers as to how and why this is the case, but I do think the ego states of most, uh, all, and I never met an egoless writer. I don't, I don't see how it could be. Not that he or she was demanding, but I mean, the point is that the, uh, no, it's just I can't see how you can have the whole world in your head without uh, having a head to have it in. It was like Gregory Corson one time during the 60s when then people were trying to lose the ego. I mean, really taking acid, for instance, and trying to lose the One way to, to, to experience loss of ego was to take acid. And the friends of the company in that situation were talking about ego loss. And Gregory was listening with some irritation, finally said, egos, egos, you're not, you know, you're not good enough to have egos, much less to lose them. You know. And, uh, and one knows that that was a sadly accurate phrase because one of the real risks was in, if one were adolescent and hadn't as yet the, uh, the individuation that Jung, for example, qualifies, if you hadn't the security of, a, of, of, of being a, a person, you, uh, you were very uh, displaced by, uh, by, by acid. I mean, you really were spun. Well, think of your daughter, Bob, just uh, going off to college. That's, a, that's an incredible moment of person. They call it a rite of passage, not just that she's gone from the house, but she's now in a world that only she has, you know, the definition. I mean, it should be defined by whomever meets her, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, she, she's, she's no longer in that situation that Gertrude Stein qualifies, but I am me because my little dog knows me, you know. There is no little dog. I mean, Boom is in, Ber you know, in Berkeley. 
Maybe you should have sent Boom along with her. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the point is, uh, again, I was thinking of the way she qualifies poetry to Higginson, and, you know, hair, hair in your head stands on end in a, like a cold tremor, she passes through your whole body. Uh, again, the, uh, there's a great poem by Bill Corbett uh, where he's speaking of the experience of having, and he means it in no mawkish or simplistic sense. He means that moment in adolescence when he had, had actually the copy of Pound's poems in his physical hands. And he's sitting in a car and snowing, and he just realizes it's, he has it. It's not that he's found God or he has the secret, but he, he has this text in his hands, this most incredible mo moment. I know what he means when you suddenly recognize that it's here, man. Not just going to tell me how to be a nice man or get a job, but this is this is incredible. Yeah. Bill Corbett is the is the person, and and Ezra Pound is the text. Oh, I, you know that's quite a. But that moment of uh, transformation is absolute. I dare say she had it far far earlier than other social patterns describe or detail, but. My, no, I think the same person. We know the same person's there because we can read all the letters and see the same conduct and the same response and the same known person. Uh, it's only later, uh, as the town goes on living, and she's first, I presume, less present in it and then finally not seemingly present at all except by hearsay, and, and she's obviously being very resistant to any, to any uh, casual... It's really hard to get to see her. Uh, Helen Hunt Jackson manages it again, almost enforces it. I mean, doesn't violate her violently, but really insists. And because they have known each other, she finally admits her, but it's extremely hard to get in. Uh, so, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The, the, uh, I mean, whatever the, however, you know. But again, I'm impressed that the, the, uh, I can't report accurately, but I hope Susan Howe or Beverly Dallin might. The, it'd be curious to know, um, is there any text on record that remarks the family's uh, displacement or confusion with her habit? I don't think there is, none that I could hit casually at least. Doesn't seem to have been, I mean, no one in this immediate pattern of family seems to have thought it was very odd. Even the sister-in-law doesn't make it a particular point, uh, who we'd presume is out, is, has, has come into the family through marriage and is a grown woman, or partially so, or whatever a grown woman is, uh, or a grown man, or whatever. But I mean, there's, it's like, uh, you know, it's like this report of someone who, who isn't really there to be, uh, and a legend begins to accumulate as towns have that. And uh, I mean, you, any one of us probably has had some sense of that where, where, where the like Mark Twain's the report of my death has been greatly exaggerated, where you've been fact of some surmise or conjecture that in no way is the fact of who you are, what you not really are, but what you otherwise would presume yourself to be. You know, I mean, I had a curious one where a woman came up and, and, and this summer we were visiting with John Duff, a friend and sculptor. We were up trying to see friends at uh, Skowhegan. School of Painting and Sculpture, and um, anyhow, uh, we were momently to leave, and uh, a pleasant woman about 40 comes walking, comes you know, hurrying up the path to say, are you, are you the poet, Robert Creeley? And I said, Prosser, yes, I'm the poet, Robert Creeley, and she said, uh, were you, uh, no, first of all, were you ever in Athens? I said, no, I've really never been to Athens. And I, and I, yeah, I said, Athens, Ohio, or Athens, Greece? I said, oh, Athens, Greece, and uh, I said, no, I've never been there. And she said, I was curious. You're, you're Robert Creeley, the poem. I said, yes, we'll see. There's another, there's a Robert Creeley who was ambassador to Greece, uh, uh, was there in ambassadorial function, and he also was a poet. And that was weird to have, I'd never heard. I mean, the, the, the paucity of Creeley's has always been remarkable to our family. There are a few, in, there's a couple in Buffalo, 
and there's some in Toronto. Tom Creeley is a TV actor, a good actor. But there are very few Creeleys on the scene. And suddenly to be told that there was another, Robert Creeley, who had this curious dignity of state and was also a poet, was really, you hear what I mean, that who's he, I wonder? <laughs> well, now I have a legend respecting him. <laughs> but I don't think that the, the playful, um, real person is submerged in some way, becomes another legend, that is the poet, but uh, in this respect of hearsay and conjecture. But I think the, uh, all, all in letters uh, she's writing to friends, the, it's like the, the friends, the cluster of friends that are particular to the school days begins to yield, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's hard on her. She sees the, uh, the particularly younger, the men who have attracted her move, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I think she, uh, she probably feels that it's the one stability is the circumstance of the place where she is and the, and the thing she has to do. Yeah. Yeah. The architectural terms, I hear you. Doors, windows, chambers, yeah. etc. So that like, poetic attention becomes a place yeah. Yeah. that's registered by yeah. here. And yeah. presence is presented, yeah. presented here. Yeah. Yeah. That's her that's absolute argument in not wanting to join the church because here is so so intense and, and, and engage, not only engaging, but so something she will not yield. And uh, that makes absolute sense to me that she will not, um, you know, that she cannot yield the, the, where she is, because that gone, there's nothing. You do. It's all becomes. She's very kind of playfully mocking of any sense of God, and, uh, like that eclipse. You know, it's, to her mind, it's uh, and she uses again characteristic. The metaphors are substantial. She's. I love the fact that in her writing the. Uh, the terms never fade in the, in the metaphor. They're always substantial, not only the substantiating of the thinking, but they are, they are vividly present, um, like no ideas but in things. So again, there are many, many curious parallels uh, that one might play with, and he certainly was aware of between Dickinson and Williams. Um, he, for example, at one point in that same piece, I think where he's saying, rather than go off and die like a sick dog, et cetera, he, says, you know, thank God that um, there's still a place one can go on living in the place he characteristically qualifies as one's own mind, you know, that consciousness and its uh, experience can still yield, be a place to live. Um, and I felt that truly with, with Pound, you know, uh, in St. Elizabeth's. That was, I mean, again, uh, I remember talking to a friend who was a young doctor in that scene who was for time a uh, doctor in Point Reyes in a He'd done his internship in the hospital and knew, was, had interest that, that made him aware that Pound was there. And his point was simply that that the physical, social situation of a of a of a hospital for the for the criminally insane was not a uh, an easy place to uh, to uh, uh, either to be comfortable in in usual social senses and or to concentrate in or work in. He was given some some. Privacy, but no, no real privacy. He had a screen or something, and had used an alcove. But I mean, he had no, he had no decisive separation from the common situation of the hospital, which had all the, um, yeah, you know, the sad fact of mental illness and all its diversity and intensities. So that it's uh, exceptionally difficult if you are working or being apart from the mental illness and its effects to find place in it. I mean, he, again, the ego is incredible. It can do it. And um, certainly the recl not the recl I mean, a lot of people visited, and there was a social company, but uh, it's fantastic what the concentration permitted. And the uh, place of the mind was fantastic. But quite apart from, yeah, not apart from, but the, again, Pound's, um, qual I would call it megalomania that makes him, I was very moved by um, Charles Bernstein's piece in Sulphur, 
of the piece he apparently read as a, as a, as a discussion of Pound at an MLA conference, which was frankly a very useful place to read it, uh, if anyone heard it. I presume people heard it. But the, uh, the sense was uh, an, an intelligence or a consciousness fighting for control of increasingly, you know, heteroclite material. The, the material was both eccentric in its disposition and plural beyond belief. And the attempt to, to you know, to, to manage a coherent, or to make, I cannot make, remember, I cannot make it cohere. Uh, well, that again is not, a, is not a singular dilemma. I mean, who can? I mean, None of the none of the present moment. I think that this breaking into into pieces and isolation, hoping isolation, stay. It's almost like going back to the, in every respect, the the, the, the fears that go through the community with the fact of AIDS, the attempt to segment and save. You know, div not divide and conquer, but divide and save. It's the most meager of imaginations. But the the um, again. That will to coherence, as Olson would qualify it, uh, was uh, seems a uh, an absolute demand that the art has in its nature, and uh, to bring bring an order to find, out of a great disorder, order out of a great yeah, was that Williams very short, but, uh, out of a great anyhow the sense is out of a great disorder order comes, um, not that the but um, how do you find the order? Not imposed, but how do you discover it and and, and recognize it and and and, uh, and articulate it? And so, again, uh, I was talking to Tom Clark earlier today, and we were talking of the uh, shifts in this in the cultural and economic patterns that are commonly experienced. The uh, well, the shift from an old-time industrial productive base to a uh, a present economy seemingly dependent on on, on, on on service industry, et cetera, et cetera, and the nature of how that affects the nature of people's just, you know, senses of what's this and what's that, the aspects of the morality, uh, relationships, all of that, and the arts uh, themselves. And this would be, as at least that they did tell us quite clearly, the uh, an essay by Ellen Tate I think it's still useful in that respect that it gives a, a quick and articulate um, cultural historical rehearsal of the uh, of the shifts of this uh, breaking down uh, Calvinistic um, pattern that had been the initiation of the coherence uh, and the 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 the, um, the absolute. Uh, not need, not it wasn't that that was the only solution, but a, some solution was certainly needed for the coherence of the initial persons, and that was the one chosen. And the whole materialistic base, insofar as one were was of the elect, if you had, that is, you would be determined as of the elect if you had the material blessings that the elect obviously would get. I mean, if God digs you, you you'll have a Cadillac. If you don't have a Cadillac, obviously God doesn't. You know and that kind of base of concept. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, the authority of that situation was beginning to break up. And uh, as, as those who went on with the material part of the condition, but didn't particularly <laughs> want to pay the dues of the, of the theocratic side of it. Anyhow, that kind of circumstance. So that it's a, and it is. I mean, someone was asking, I think, very aptly in the last uh, Meeting whether uh, Emily Dickinson was was affected or particularly involved with the fact of the Civil War, um, I think uh, she obviously was in the sense that the uh, that the, um, the 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 extraordinary change uh, in imagination the war was affecting must must certainly reaches her. Yeah, not, but anyhow, it's not simply that she talks about dying, but it's a mo moment of extraordinary crisis that she's feeling, I'm sure, in, as part of her own, her own, her own um, life. Not as reference, but it's, it's all part, all part. Again, you see what's both magnificent in one sense, but awesome in one sense, and also uh, at times humanly. Uh, Absolutely, almost horrifying is that uh, an artist can presume to 
to, to, to think he or she has the whole world in mind. You know, it can be glorious if it's Blake and not so happy if it's Celine. I mean, in the sense that the one is approved for doing it and the other, of course, is considered to be a, a, a pro-Nazi monster. But in, in the art, isn't it the arts are divorced from the political condition because we live literal lives and lives with others and political and social covenants or, or lacks thereof. But the, um, the art paradox, it isn't that it's not political, it doesn't want to be political, but that it, it, it presumes the whole world. It's like, again, Williams is absolutely apt. You know, in the, you know, in the, the, poem, the sun rises and sets in the poem. You know. It's absolutely explicit. And he means it, he's not kidding. The sun rises and sets in the poem. Or anyhow, you hear. So that it's a, it's a, on the one hand, it's an act of heroic magnitude, uh, but on the other hand, it's awesome because how come they get to have the whole world and we have to pay attention? You know? <laughs> Any questions before? Yeah, you know, I have nothing remarkably more to say. Uh, I never did. <laughs> I mean, those of you in the class particularly would be interesting to, to, to think of, uh, because you know, what are you finding as, what are you finding any of you as, as this, you know, it's a hard, hard to be a, anyhow. Um, in terms of uh, summarizing and setting the poem, uh, the thing that's striking me at the moment most about the work is um, sort of where it places their displaces me in time. Yeah. Yeah. Or caught somehow too. I wonder if you could, could talk about that. Because it's really like we were talking about it before, and the first, first thing that made me do was try to read the theory of relativity. Well, for instance, in the in the in the wry disposition of the forties, one has the, the young of the forties, who had, for example, as primary uh, intellectual, social, and philosophic locus. Uh, Writers, particularly as Kafka or Dostoevsky or uh, the emerging clarities uh, or, or Gide, actually, in texts like Lafcadio's Adventures, <laughs> the, the, the shrink of the, not so much of the human imagination, but of the place of the human, human facts in imagination, the shrink from a into an utterly secular, you know, and actualized uh, physical reality. Uh, the, the, the circumstance which, which um, comes to define itself as existentialism, uh, the unrelieved situation of human life with no order or coherence or, or reference beyond its own event. Uh, in any case, <coughs> we, I remember, I remember two things. One was an, uh, an insistent <coughs> sardonic quoting of uh, Roosevelt's remark that we had nothing to fear but fear itself. That was a classic that kept coming. People would use that always as a kind of semi black humor joke. And the other was uh, the statistic, the only statistic that is ultimately, quote, true is that one out of every one will die. <laughs> um, and that both pleased and terrified us. There was at least something we could depend upon. Like that no one's going to get out of here alive. You know? uh, whatever world you presume to live in, you're not going to get out of it alive. And that was, again, that possibly was more emphatic in New England with its curious um, habits. But the, um, the um, it's as though she goes to the most crucial factor of human human existence, which is that one out of every one will die. And it's not just its resonance, but again, civil war, its resonance must have been absolute, and also its practical sad fact in, in, in daily circumstance, the fact that the, uh, the physical life of the times was, was, um, was very vulnerable to, you know, to an incredible spectrum of uh, physical circumstances, such as the, again, but uh, the echoes for me in this respect that the, I remember reading some qualification of what were considered catastrophes in, say, the 19th century and in the 20th century and their, their, their seeming causation. 
Well, in the 19th century, um, catastrophes were, were almost without exception the effects of physical, like the earthquake, and sadly in Mexico, the earthquakes. Floods, fam things of that sort, they're almost entirely beyond the control of the, of the human, human, human circumstance, and the, including, say, epidemics of illness. And uh, in the 20th century, they are insistently and increasingly the actual, you know, determinations of other human beings. Uh, that they're not simply that there could have been a corrective, but things like Three Mile, Mile Island don't happen without humans creating the possibility, et cetera, et cetera. And wars don't happen without persons creating the possibility, et cetera, et cetera, or atom bombs or things of that sort. So again, I think she goes precisely to the, <coughs> the most uh, <coughs> central information.